Welcome to part 57 of the video series on how to use Blender 2.7. In this video, I'll be talking about post-processing and adding video effects to your animations as you render them out. As many of you know, Blender is not only a 3D modeling and animation program, but it's also a video editing program and a powerful compositing program. We're going to be using some of those tools in this video to add effects to our animations as we're rendering them out, which will save us the problem of having to bring our video, once it's rendered, out to a different video editing program to adjust colors and brightness and contrast and add effects when we can do it all in one step. For this video, I'll actually be providing you with a link to download this exact file so you can follow along with me. I'll find a link to download it in the description area below. Let's go ahead and jump in. This scene, or this file, has an animation of a snowman sliding in from the left side of the scene and kind of stopping and doing a little wave to the camera. The animation is done, the modeling is done, the camera's in the right spot, I'm all happy with it, I'm ready to render, except I want to adjust some of the colors and effects of my scene. So what I can do here is change my big 3D viewport window into a different window, it's called the Video Sequence Editor window. So I'll click on the uh, button on the header of the 3D viewport and change it to that window, it's called a Video Sequence Editor, and this is Blender's video editing window. When it first comes up it looks just sort of like a timeline of a video editing program, but there's no video port. And that's because there's three ways of looking at this window. Right now we're looking at it as the sequencer, and there are three buttons for these three options. The first button is for the sequencer view. The second button is for the viewer view, so you can actually see your video here when you're working on it. And the third way it looks is both. It's a split view. And watch out, those three buttons sort of slide around depending on which view that you're in. Let's go ahead and have both on the screen now, so I'll click that third button. There we go, I have a viewer up here and a sequencer down here. Now when you first bring this window up, it has nothing in it. And that's because we haven't added anything to it. We could add external video files and images and sound files. But what we'll actually do is under the Add menu where you see all those options. You, add, you see movies, you see images, you see sounds that you can add from other files. But you can also add scenes from your current file. Now when I add a scene, it lists for, for me here what scene I want to add. I only have one scene, it's just the animation of the snowman, and I never named that scene. Uh, let's go ahead and do that first though. So up here on the information bar in Blender, uh, this is my current scene, and it's not named, or it's named just the default. So I'll type in snowman-animation, and I'll press enter. So now if I go down to add scene, it'll list snowman animation here. When I do that, it adds it to the sequencer, and it's sort of lost in my sequencer timeline uh, down here, but it's actually over here. Let's go ahead and scroll down to zoom out. As you can see, when you add something to your sequencer, it adds it in what's called a strip. And you can press G with it selected to move it around. And of course, if you have multiple strips, you can right click to select each one, which you'll see in just a moment. You can move it to different tracks. And the higher up the track is, uh, it'll be in front the higher up it goes. You'll see that in just a moment as well. I want to make sure when I press G to start this uh, clip right at frame 1, you can see the bottom left corner of that strip, and it ends at frame 105, which is the same length as my timeline. Let's go ahead and scroll up to zoom in to make that a little bit larger. The first thing I'll do is I'm going to adjust the way that my scene looks in the viewer of this window. Right now, it's sort of cropped at the top and the bottom. That's because it's zoomed in. I can scroll down and scroll up with my mouse in this window. Uh, so I'll scroll down. You can also orbit by pressing your mouse wheel down to move it around. Let's bring up the properties panel on the right hand side with its little plus or the N key as always. And there's a lot of things going on here. But what I want to do is find this section. I'll collapse them all. Let's me change my display type. Uh, and what that means is right now my scene is not rendered, which means that it's giving me like a preview here, but there are no colors. Uh, I have to be careful here because I can't have a rendered preview because rendering takes a long time, but I can have uh, colors or materials uh, in this viewer. So once these are all collapsed in the properties panel, I can change my scene preview render from solid up to material. And again, there's a warning here, do not change it to rendered. That might crash Blender or even crash your computer. It does not work very well. This is an OpenGL preview, which means a very quick preview, sort of like a game engine. 
Um, I would not uncheck that. I would not go to rendered. Again, it does not work very well, even on a fast computer. Great. I can see the colors of my scene. I can't see lighting very well, but this will give me an idea of what my effects will do before I render them out. Let's go ahead and scrub around and we can see the animation. That works out great. Let's go ahead and add an effect. There's two ways of doing that. We can add what are called modifiers and we can add what are called effect strips. Let's add some modifiers first. With the scene strip selected, I'll go over to the modifier section and expand it out. And if we click on add strip modifiers, we can see what we have available here. These are all pretty well color adjustments. We have color balance, curves, hue correct, brightness and contrast. This one's a little bit different. It's for masking. You can add masks. If you've made masks uh, already, you can add them here. Um, white balance and tone maps. Let's go ahead and add um, brightness and contrast. You know, see what it looks like. This is sort of like modifiers in our 3D world in the properties window under the wrench tab uh, where you add more modifiers and they get put in a stack. So we have our first one here. It's the brightness and contrast modifier. You can get rid of it and you can add multiple modifiers. Um, there it is again. We can adjust the brightness and contrast of our scene. So if I drag this down, the scene will get darker. If I turn the contrast up, then of course it'll get more uh, contrasty. I can collapse this modifier and add more. Let's go ahead and add a hue correct modifier. And as you can see, we get a place where we can actually pull colors out of our scene or add the intensity up of certain colors. So if I pull all of the red markers down, uh, there were kind of three of them. You can see that the red in my scene disappears. That's kind of interesting. Let's go ahead and add another one. Let's go ahead and add uh, curves. This is a very powerful modifier. If you're not familiar with curves in any program like Photoshop or GIMP, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about color theory, but basically you can click anywhere in the diagonal line to add a new point to make a curve, and this will make your scene uh, be more contrasted or uh, dull, and you can really play with these curves and make it really look wacky. If you want to get rid of points in your curve, you can click on the little X and left click to select more and click on X. Let's go ahead and go back to the default. If you drag the points horizontally inwards, you'll make your scene more contrasty as well, although you get much, much more control here over your scene. If you don't want some of the uh, modifiers anymore, of course, you can click X to get rid of them and your scene will go back to the way it was originally. Great. The other way that you can change your scene is by using effect strips. And the way these work is they actually get placed above your original scene or video file in the tracks of your sequencer. So with this scene selected, I'm going to go down to add or I'll press shift E on my keyboard. I'm going to add an effect strip and you get different options here. I'm going to add a Gaussian blur effect, which we did not have with modifiers. So shift A, uh, effect strip, Gaussian blur. And when I do that, it adds a new effect strip above in the same duration um, as the original scene. Now with that effect strip selected, it hasn't actually done anything yet. And that's because over here in the properties panel, um, there is now a different set of, of areas. We have effect strip options and edit strip as well. Um, what I'll do here is under effect strip, I'll change the X and the Y values. In fact, I will click in them and I'll type maybe 30 and 30 for X and Y. And as you can see, the scene is now blurred. It has a Gaussian blur effect on it. I can add more effect strips. So what I'll do is with my original uh, clip selected, I'll press Shift A on my keyboard. I'll add a glow effect and it'll add itself to a track in the sequencer. And as you can see, it's already had an effect. If I have it selected and I press H, it'll hide that effect. In fact, I'll do that through blur as well. I'll select it and press H. If you want to show or unhide effect strips, you can select it and press Alt H and that will unhide it. So select each one, Alt H, and select this one, Alt H, and it'll show up again. So that's adding modifiers and effect strips. I'm not going to talk any more about this window because we're going to switch over now into the much more powerful area of using nodes, specifically compositing nodes, to add color adjustments and effects to your scenes before you render them out. Let's go ahead and delete all the strips in our video sequence editor. So I'll select each one and press X on my keyboard. Uh, let's do that. And I'll change this entire window type into a node editor window right here. 
If you've used Blender Cycles to add materials, you know what nodes are. They're a little bit funny and there's a bit of a learning curve to understanding them, but the more you use them, the more they make sense. We're not going to be using material nodes this time to add effects. We're going to be using compositing nodes. And to do that, we have to change the mode of this window uh, down at the bottom on its header uh, from material nodes over to compositing nodes. It looks like a couple of photos that are stacked one above the other. And we also have to check use nodes. In fact, I'm going to check all three buttons, use nodes, backdrop, and auto render. I'll talk what all of these three things are. And if you've used nodes before to add materials to objects in Blender Cycles, you'll know that you always have to have the same start and end nodes in order for the whole thing to work. Uh, in this case, we have a render layers node, which I'll move with the G key over to the left side. And we have a composite node, which I'll move over to the right side. When you're compositing, it's going to be a handy thing for you to see what the effect is right away on your scene. Uh, that's why I clicked on this little backdrop checkbox, because what we want to happen is for our effects that we're adding, the color adjusting nodes, to actually show up with a preview in the background of this window. We also want to have this window update if we make a change in our 3D scene. I'm not going to do that, so actually what I have to do to make a backdrop show up in this case is I'm going to press Shift A on my keyboard to add a node. I'm going to add what's called a viewer. And what this does, it basically enables um, the backdrop to work. I'm not really sure why they didn't build this into Blender without having to add it, but we need that node there. I also have to connect it, just like the composite, which is our real output, to any nodes that we have before it. So I'll drag the image of our render layers, that means our 3D scene, to that viewer as well. And I need a render. That means I need to render one scene of my animation. Right now I'm on frame 70. So let's go ahead and press render. I actually sped that render up for the sake of this video. Let's go ahead now and close this render window. And as you can see now that I've done one render, I have a backdrop in my node editor window. It's actually cropped though, because the render is quite large. So what I'll do is I'll press V on my keyboard with my mouse in the node editor window, and the V key uh, zooms out on the backdrop. It's sort of a funny key for that. If you press it too many times and it gets too small, you can press Alt V on your keyboard, and Alt V will zoom the backdrop back in. And if you want to kind of pan around um, the backdrop, um, if I orbit in this window, it actually pans around the nodes. But if I hold Alt and orbit, it'll pan around the background. So orbiting with your mouse wheel, it pans around the nodes, and holding Alt and orbiting pans around that background. Great. It's in the middle of these nodes that I already have that I can add any effects or adjustment nodes that I'd like. Let's go ahead and add one. I'll press Shift A on my keyboard to bring up the Add menu. And under Color, you can see what options I have here. I can do things like adjust the curves, or color balance, or hue saturation value, or gamma of my render. Let's go ahead and press Shift A. I'll add a color, and let's use curves again. Now, I really need to, in order for this to work, drag this new node in the middle of the noodle that goes out to the composite. So if I drag this up into there, you can see the noodle gets highlighted. And if I let go, it inserts itself in the middle of that noodle, making two smaller noodles. But in order for this backdrop to work, I need to reconnect the output of this new adjustment node to the viewer as well. So I'll drag the output of this curves node to the viewer. And so now it, it'll actually show up in the backdrop and not only when I render out my animation. Let's go ahead and play with the curves. I will make it a little bit more contrasty. That's great. Maybe I'll play with the middle as well. The curves uh, window also lets you specify between the brightness and darkness or the red or green or blue channel. So you can adjust each one independently. I can make the scene more blue if I want by taking down some of the red value. Maybe I'll make the, br the bright colors a bit red and the dark values a bit blue by adjusting that. And maybe I'll make the green a little bit higher in this scene as well, just a little bit though. Great, let's go ahead and add another adjustment note. So I'll press Shift A on my keyboard. We'll add a color balance node, just like we did before again. And this time, I'll put it before RGB curves. That's easier because there's only one noodle to insert it in. If I put it over here, I could repeat the process where I had to reconnect the viewer to the output of my last adjustment node. Let's go ahead and do that. So now, if I adjust these three colors, uh, and I'm not going to get into what lift, gamma, and gain mean in this video, I have the effect that I want. 
There is a really cool effect that I've recently found. Let's go ahead and add it. I'll press the A on my keyboard. I'm gonna add a distort and lens distortion effect. And so when I add that, I'll add it last in the sequence of adjustment nodes. So I'll add it right there, and I'll reconnect my output of my last adjustment node to the viewer. And what this node does, I'll kind of move it out of the way, is it simulates distortion of either a fish eye or a wide angle lens. And what I'll do here is I'll turn up distort a lot. It only goes up to one actually. And you can see what this looks like. It looks like a fisheye lens. I can click on the fit checkbox and that will make it so that it fits within a rectangle. It's very sensitive I find. And if you go the other way, it looks like a very, very wide angle lens. Be careful with these values. Uh, they can get pretty wacky. And I can also turn up dispersion. That's what that last word says. Uh, dispersion will make it look like the colors are separating in my scene and it gets very, very blurry towards the edges of the frame. That looks pretty cool. If I don't want that same exact effect, what I can do is check on projector and that way you won't get the same lens distortion effect, but you will have color separation. That looks pretty cool to me, but I'll leave it uh, with projector unselected. Great. Um, I think we're pretty much done here. I'm ready to render out. And if I want to do that, I can do that right away. Of course, I can change all of my output settings. I'm not going to render out to a PNG image sequence, though. I want to actually change this to a video file. I'm going to use the H.264 video codec, which is a very, very common video codec. I need to change some of my encoding settings as well because of the video file. I don't want an AVI file. I'd rather have a file that ends in .mpeg4 or .mp4 and I'll leave everything else the same. I'm not actually going to render out in this video the entire animation, but I will click render so you can see what that looks like. When you click render, it'll actually show you the original file or the original image first, but every time it renders out a frame, once it finishes that frame, it'll then apply the distortion. So you'll see it render out the original image, and then you'll see it become distorted once it finishes the edges of the frame. And there we go. That's the final result. That'll be it for this video. Thanks for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks. Bye.